Hello, everyone. My name is Tweet Cooper, and I serve as the um, membership co-chair of the UCLA Black Alumni Association. On behalf of the association, I want to welcome you to the Social Justice Summit. We thank you for your participation and encourage you to join us for the full weekend of, weekend of events. Follow us on our Facebook and IG social media pages and find out more about us by going to our website at www.uclablackalumni.org and become a member and donor in 2021. I'd like to share some housekeeping with you so that you have the best experience across these four days. One, everyone will be muted for, um, sorry, everyone will be muted for the duration of uh, the event unless the moderator indicates that there will be a Q&A period where you may ask questions directly. Comments and questions should be directed to the chat and will be highlighted as time permits. You may control your view inside the Zoom by going to the top right corner of your window and toggling between active, screen, active speaker and gallery view. This way you can either see the person speaking in the big screen or the full audience. We do virtual applause by snap of the fingers like this. So please feel free to do that when you want to show appreciation for what you are hearing. Now that, now that aside, I want to encourage you to greet others in the room. This, this is intended, to, this is intended to be a place of community. So reach out and say hello. Your chats will be public unless you tap the person's name first, which will initiate a private chat. We will be monitoring the room for bad, bad actors who may try to disrupt this event with event with offensive language, images, and violators will be expelled immediately. With that, I'd like to bring forward the woman who sits at the helm of UBAA, um, a non-traditional student who's persevered to complete her education more than 20 years after she entered as a freshman former UCLA homecoming queen, a member of Sigma Gamma Rho Sorority Incorporated, and co-owner of LP Productions, which is providing the virtual production support for this weekend's event. She is Madame President Michelle Johnson. Thank you, Twee, so much for that. I um, appreciate you setting the stage. Um, I want to tell everyone, um, please get comfortable uh, as Twee encouraged and get ready for a tremendous, tremendous um, four-day event. Again, my name is Michelle Johnson. I'm the uh, presiding president of UCLA Black Alumni Association, uh, which I personally believe is the best alumni association in the nation. Um, on behalf of our officers, our board of directors, our members, donors, uh, community partners, and friends, I want to warmly welcome you to our 2021 summit. Um, for those of you that do not know, UCLA Black Alumni Association was founded in 1968 with a mission to be a source of support, uh, networking and engagement for our fellow alumni, as well as providing much needed scholarship dollars for our incoming African American students. Uh, Black Bruins very proudly have been involved in some of the greatest movements, accomplishments, uh, and advancements of social justice throughout history, whether we're talking about Angela Davis and uh, you know Jackie Robinson to the Freedom Fighters, Bunchy Carter, um, whether we're fighting for the divestment uh, of uh, from South Africa um, on a global stage or, or fighting for greater representation on the UCLA campus for students, faculty, and staff. We've always been here. Um, the work that um, our folks do, educators like Malefia Asante, Dr. Kelly Light Hernandez, uh, Dr. Tyrone Howard, uh, Professor Darnell Hunt, the list goes on and on. Our researchers, our political agitators, our community uh, organizers, our medical and law professionals, you get the picture. Black Bruins are doing it in a major way. Um, so we're very, very proud of, of that work that we do. And, and now as we move um, out of what was probably the most disruptive year in our lifetime, definitely in mine, uh, into 2021. We are hopeful in a great many things, um, but we also realize that we have to be sober about what brings us here. Um, social justice, we know, is not accomplished with just the change of a president. Um, it's achieved 
really by the sheer will of community to educate, to organize, uh, and to lift our voices to be heard. And UBA takes that responsibility very seriously. And so we're here for our third uh, social justice summit, despite COVID, uh, despite the craziness that we just witnessed as a country yesterday, um, and we're determined to make an impact in 2021. So throughout this four day event, we encourage you to think about how you can make an impact, where you can make an impact. As a volunteer organization, we obviously can't do this by ourselves. Um, so we find strength in the partnerships that we forge together with our fellow alumni and with our strategic partners, which actually brings me to today's event. Uh, UBA has been able to, in past years, partner with C-SPAN, Netflix, HBO Max, you know. Um, this year, we're thrilled to add ABC to that list and Ebony Publishing Company, uh, which is celebrating uh, 75 years of existence. And we're actually super honored to have uh, Sabrina Taylor, who is a publicist, a producer, and the chief communications officer for Ebony Magazine with us. And I would love to, at this time, have Sabrina say just a few words, please. Thank you, Ms. Sabrina. Uh, it's my pleasure, and I'm gonna be really, really brief, but yes, for 75 years, the Ebony brand has been really proud to be the leader and at the forefront of being sort of the quintessential voice for African-Americans. And we are so proud to align ourselves with the UCLA Alumni Association. Um, what, UCLA, you, what UCLA has done by keeping their students and faculty at the fore right, forefront of civil rights movements has been astonishing. Um, it, it, it doesn't surprise us that the partnership between UCLA and Netflix was an easy one to talk about the film we're talking about tonight. Um, I love that Netflix will take a risk and put out content such as a love song for Latasha, um, you know, this is the type of change we need to see in the world. So while we're spending, it's easy to spend so much time on, on the dissonance that happened in 2020 um, and what we just saw yesterday, but UCLA breeds change makers and the change makers that UCLA is breeding, you know, we know that Netflix will be there to help showcase them as will Ebony. So we don't wanna take up too much time. This is a really, really, really exciting program tonight. We are honored to be a part. We look forward to being a part and working with you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sabrina. So what I will say also, um, and give some special thanks to uh, our alumni, uh, Bonnie Abunza, uh, for her ability to bring these amazing synergies together with Netflix. We are so appreciative of you, Bonnie. Um, don't know what we would do without you. you you've really been uh, an awesome, awesome uh, contribution to the overall work that we're doing um, as an organization. So I thank you for that tremendously. Um, what I'd like to do at this time is, because I know you guys are getting tired of hearing my voice, uh, is to turn to the matter at hand. And I would love for you to focus your attention on this brief uh, trailer that is uh, for a love song for Latasha, which is what we are talking about tonight. We'll play that right now. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, your panel for tonight as we discuss this extraordinarily uh, creative work memorializing the life of a young girl who was killed over a dollar and 79 cent orange juice. Um, that act would be part of what ignited um, the riots in our city 30 years ago. And we're here to talk about it um, tonight. So first up as part of our panel is Bobby Grace. Bobby is a deputy district attorney with Los Angeles County. He serves as the chairman, uh, the beloved chairman of our board of directors for UCLA Black Alumni Association. He is a former USAC student president of UCLA and he's also a member of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. Uh, I'll just spotlight him really quickly. He'll talk later. Bobby, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you. Okay, uh, next up, 
we have this amazing woman. I'm actually just in awe of the work that she is doing, uh, putting God first. Reverend Mrs. Paulette Simpson Gibson is an, indoor, an ordained minister with 24 years of ministry experience, and she currently serves as the associate minister at Greater Faith Missionary Baptist Church. She is a, uh, a veteran of the United States Air Force, uh, and she was also elected the first woman president of the Compton NAACP in 2008. And with six, and I say that again, six elections, <laughs> six elections, she has served for 13 years. That is an accomplishment. And I just got to give you snaps because I'm in three going, Lord help me. So to serve that long, <laughs> through her leadership, the content branch of the NAACP has received the 2018 Dr. H. Claude Award for a small branch carrying out the, uh, the national mission. And in 2019, it was chosen as the pilot site uh, to launch the new national, our communities, our power, advancing resistance and resilience in climate change adaption toolkit. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your snaps and your fingers together for Reverend Paulette Gibson, who joins us as well. We're so pleased to have her. Um, finally, finally, the star of the night. Uh, I'm so, so excited to bring forth. Uh, her name is Sophia Nali Allison. Uh, she is a black, queer, radical dreamer, experimental documentary filmmaker and photographer from South Central LA. She disrupts conventional documentary methods by reimagining the archives and excavating hidden truths. A meditation of the spirit, her work conjures ancestral memories to explore the intersection of fiction and nonfiction storytelling. She's a 2020 United States Artist Fellow in Film and has held residencies at McDowell, the Camargo Foundation in Cases, France, the Center for Photography at Woodstock, and POV Sparks African Interactive Art Residency. She's currently working on her long-term project, which is Dreaming Gave Us Wings, and she's the director of this amazing body of work that we're going to talk about tonight, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Sophia Nali. Hello, Sophia. Hi, Michelle. Hello. You make me want to be a part of this alumni group. I wish I was <laughs> a Yes. We Thank accept you. supporters. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and you know what? Thank you so much. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Bobby and uh, Paulette and let them take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby and Paulette. Hi. Right. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us, Sophia. Um, and, and thank you, uh, Paulette, for joining us. And thank you for all you do with respect to uh, NAACP in Compton. Yeah. Uh, I actually work there, so I got to come and visit you. Um, thank you. For sure. Um, so, Sophia, let's get right into this. Um, uh, you had to either not been born or a child at the time um, that Latasha was killed in 1991. Um, so the question just immediately comes to mind is, is how did you come upon um, this young woman, this young lady um, as a subject matter for um, your film? So I, I was a baby, I was about four years old. Um, and so I just have very fragmented memories of the LA riots. And when I was an adult in my early, in my mid twenties, I was really shocked to realize I didn't know much about Latasha, that that was a story I didn't often hear even as an LA native. Um, and just really wanting to see this archive rebirthed, wanting Latasha to exist around a different narrative beyond just her trauma, beyond the death, wanting Latasha's spirit to, you know, to, to live in South Central as it should have. Um, when I often think about the archives for black women and black girls, just, you know, I am so disheartened to realize how often our stories are erased, how often um, our stories are not archived properly. And what does that mean for us to resurrect them? What does that mean for us to heal the community, heal one another by making sure, you know, these stories exist in their fullness. So um, 
I moved back to LA during the 25th year anniversary of the LA riots. And that's when I realized this is the time to start working on a project about Latasha. And I really wanted this just to be a spiritual archive for the community. I wanted it to be, I wanted this young girl to finally have her moment of people knowing who she was, understanding how important her life was, understanding why this, you know, injustice is so important to the history of South Central. Excellent. And then um, also wanted to know, um, your background initially was in photography and, and I've seen a lot of your pieces. Um, uh, how did you come up with the idea of kind of uh, almost a mixed media approach to this documentary where you're using animation, you're using um, kind of raw cut footage, um, interviews with people, but also using uh, folks from the community as characters, yes. if you will, with respect to the movie. How did you come up with that idea? Yes. So I, I knew this piece had to be experimental because there wasn't archival video footage to actually pull from. There wasn't any tangible evidence of these stories. And so really wanting to honor the memories that Ty and Shani shared with me, honoring that oral history and knowing that because there was no archival footage I could use, this would have to exist in a hybrid form. It would have to be these reimagined vignettes that allow us to travel through throughout this dream space. And wanting it to, to feel like this is a, an intimate invitation into these this, this world of these black girls, this is a secret language that has always been kept safe, a secret memory that has always been kept safe. And, and just to really honor that by making sure black girls saw themselves reflected in the film. Um, I never wanted to have this feel like a fictionalized or um, a scripted piece, but using fiction elements to help bring the story to life. And so there is not one girl that plays Latasha. I wanted to make sure black girls, when they watch this, they could see the image revolving. They could see themselves in all of these girls. Um, and so by using young black girls from the community, making sure that it, it, it felt like this authentic collaborative process of how do we all come together to remember Latasha? How do we all come together to tell her story? And what was so beautiful about that is just the different people that I worked with, some would tell me that they remembered, you know, Latasha from when they were young adults in South Central. Some of the young girls I used, I went to high school with their parents in LA. So it, it was just this beautiful, um, collective synergy or how do we as a community heal? How do we as a community hold space for this story? And how do we as a community come together to remember Latasha? Um, and, and just wanting it to, wanting, wanting the style to disrupt what I've been taught documentary had to be, what I've been taught um, it means to decolonize documentary that just because there is not video footage, you know, with the exception of her death, which we don't use in the film, how do we reimagine the archive and reclaim these stories for ourselves? Excellent. Let me let Paulette jump in here for yes, Paulette. question. So, you know, I, I love the documentary and I just want to say, um, I just want to thank you for bringing her to life because people have turned over the years her story has not been told. So I kind of want to know, we know that that was a vital time in, in our community and race relations were high. Mm -hmm. And when you wrote the documentary, did you have any thought to the race, race relations then and how they are now? I'm sorry, have any thought to what? I think it's race out. relations oh, between yes. the African-American community yes. and the Korean community yes. since this has happened. Yes, that's uh, such a beautiful and important question. I, I thought heavily about what was the relationship between um, Koreans and black Los Angeles or bl black folks in LA and just how that history is one that needs to be interrogated beyond just the story of Latasha. I really grappled with, is this something that I should incorporate? Do I have the time and the space to really delve into that? Or does this need to just be, here's an introduction to Latasha and it's up to us to continue this work to in continue interrogating. Um, but even you know myself, my own personal experience as a young black girl in South Central and my friends, we all have had that moment where you walk into a convenience store, walk into a liquor store and you are hyper, 
visible, that you are watched the entire time, um, and you know how we are taught to handle ourselves within a liquor store. So that is something that I deeply thought about a lot, even thinking about how does white supremacy play a role in this relationship? What happens when you force two communities together? There is a scarcity of jobs, a scarcity of resources, and you know what happens when Black folks see their community um, they don't see the ownership within their community. They see Korean Americans having ownership within South Central. How does that create tension? How does anti-Blackness create tension within the community? Um, so that was something that I kept thinking, how much can I delve into this? It's so important to understand that relationship to realize why someone like Soon Ja Do would have even have felt threatened by Latasha because of ideas of anti-Blackness that she'd been fed, because of ideas that, you know, um, how, how white supremacy has taught what to be fearful of when it comes to Black bodies, Black individuals. And even when I was reading the court documents between Judge Joyce Carlin and how she would speak about Soon Ja Du and the ways in which she supported Soon Ja Du's decision, you know, saying that it was understandable why she felt threatened um, and so even my own interrogation into what is the adultification of black girls, why is it that we have been seen as um, threatening, as, as violent, as loud or rambunctious. And so Georgetown Law has a really powerful and important study about the adultification of black girls. So letting all of this information influence my work, but ultimately realizing I wanted the story to focus on the life of Latasha and hoping that these conversations would come out of the film, that we would start to interrogate and dismantle um, these systems that have unjustly, you know, kept us in danger, that have, have created um, a violent environment for us to exist in. See, and, and so I'm glad you said that because one of the good things that telling her story has done, it has, it's, it's kind of unmasked the justice system. Yes. yes. And so even in, in your investigations and you're looking into this, this may be a good opportunity for our next generation to dialogue about the history of the justice system and how unfair it has been. Yes. And so I'm glad you pointed out the positive what's happening with Latasha Light. Between be. 2017. Oh, sorry, between 2017 and 2019, when I was working on the film, there were a lot of news reports that began to come out with young black girls that were um, their interactions with police officers. So if people remember uh, the young black girl in school who was body slammed by um, a school guard in high school, or when there was, um, I forget what state it was, but young black kids at a pool party and a young girl again being slammed to the ground and it, pinned down by that. a police officer so it's just yeah. this this cyclical it's a violent cyclical pattern that we're seeing and so it's so important for young folks for young black folks to understand the history before them how nothing has changed and what needs to happen to dismantle it um because even the week that the film came out that's when the the verdict on brianna taylor was announced and so yeah. it was just these these very haunting moments of of realizing nothing has changed it's just a different day All right and and kind of jumping off on that sophia um, you um, you talked a little bit about how your earliest memories as a child were of the the uprising after um, Rodney King, the Rodney King verdicts. And um, I'd like to note from, from your generation um, and, and as a filmmaker, um, how did your, uh, your experiences with, um, with the Rodney King um, uprising and the violence that occurred within our community um, how has that informed your work now? And uh, how do you juxtapose what was happening back in 1992 with what is happening here in, um, in 2020, 2021, and, uh, and Black Lives Matter trying to dismantle um, structural racism in America, poli um, unfair policing, um, how is that informing your your filmmaking, your your photography, your work as an artist? 
Yeah, this is a beautiful question. Um, I think the the main thing is it's it's um, it's made me really question what happens to the psyche when we constantly see images of Black death, where we as Black <sighs> folks, what happens to us when on the news nonstop or visuals of black bodies being killed, black bodies being brutalized. And who does that really serve? Is that for us or is that for others to humanize who we are and not needing to see that to humanize, um, you know, just our existence to, to validate our existence, to validate why we need protection. And I remember as a young girl constantly seeing the Rodney King footage um, I remember that's, you know, that's a, a video that is very vivid within my mind. And when I've talked to generations above me, they vividly remember the Latasha Harlan's footage, which is really interesting just to see, you know, did my parents keep me removed from that? Um, what did my parents not want me to see based on here we're seeing a beating versus here we're seeing a young girl's actual death. And, and as we have moved into now this, the movement for black lives and the liberation for black lives, just the conversations that really stick with me are how black people are pleading to stop showing the footage, stop showing our death. And so when I began this project being very intentional from the beginning that the footage of Latasha's death would never be seen in this film, it was way too accessible. You know, as we hear from Ty within the movie, it's something that deeply traumatized her, deeply harmed her to see that and was, um, and there are many times where I've spoken to black elders and they thanked me for not using that video, that footage in the film because they were so used to seeing it, you know, it's been imprinted into their minds. And so I have really taken from that time, taken from the work that we're seeing with Black Lives Matter is what does it mean to care for the community as we're doing this work? What does it mean for us to, to challenge these systems to openly speak about white supremacy, to speak about liberating black lives, but we don't need to center black death in doing that. Um, and so wanting to find ways that can be more holistic, wanting to find ways that are healing. So for this, making sure the images that we see of young black girls, it is always them in the most positive light possible. It is seeing them in nature. It is seeing them free in themselves. And by not having the footage reminding people that Latasha's life wasn't important because of her death. It wasn't important because of how it ended. It was important before all of that. It would it's it still is important. Um, and so just thinking about ways that we can um, thinking of ways that we can start to shift how we engage with death, how we engage with um, the media, what we see, how we are painted within that picture, and making sure that even when we memorialize people in death, we're still making sure that we honor ourselves in life. Um, and so just really not wanting images of black death to be something that black folks are constantly seeing. I, I just felt that would be really insensitive, um, that would be careless, that would not hold space for the community, for the Harlan's family. You know, I never wanted to re-trigger anyone or re-traumatize anybody um, by showing that footage. You know, the thing, and I'm I so wanted to jump into that a little yeah. bit about um, the artistic part of it and how it helps kids. Yes, Paulette. So, to, I mean, Sophia, I'm, I'm very, so, I'm very proud of you because I love the fact that you told what her future could have been. Mm -hmm. Too often, our young people are dying in the street like they meant nothing. So it's good that people get to see this is where she had dreams. Yes. And so you're telling the story that I love, and I'm glad that you decided to go that route to tell the what her future could have been. How many of our kids are dying in the street and we're snuffing out our future? Yes. 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 How do thank we you. continue that story for them? Um, yes. yes, thank you so much for, for saying that, Paulette. I, I just I wanted us to know. This is a life that was stolen. This is a life yes. that was nowhere near done. Who could she have been? She, you know, we yes. just celebrated her 45th birthday on January yes. 1st, where Netflix helped us celebrate by sponsoring a, a mural mm -hmm. of her yes. at the park where she, Ty, and Shanice used to play. And, you know, why is it taken 30 years for us to even 
you know, a simple act is how, how can we see her within right. the community? How can we make sure other young black girls see her? Other young black girls knew what her goal was. Her goals were her dreams and her aspirations. Um, and also wanting that to speak to, even though Latasha wasn't able to continue this dream, she passed this down through Ty and Shanice. They right now have been working and, and creating their own nonprofit for youth in South Central. Um, right. And they're planning a huge, you know, event on to, to commemorate her 30th anniversary um, for the community. And this is something that Latasha spoke about. How do we engage with the community? How do we make sure the young folks have the resources to accomplish their dreams, to you know, have somewhere to go after school? So it's been beautiful to see how that was a dream that did not stop with Latasha and how this film has helped keep that alive. I mean, Ty and Shanice were going to do this with or without the film, but the film has helped support that vision. This film has really helped make sure they are visible in the ways they need to continue to continue, um, you know, doing what Latasha wanted. Yeah. And, and Sophia, talk a little bit about um, your work as an artist and, and how that's informed by um, the, the social justice um, moment that we're going through right now, you know, what responsibility do you feel toward, um, you know, reflecting that in your art? Do you feel a responsibility? I, I feel through the film and, and your eloquence that you do, but I'd like to know, you know, how you feel about it in, you know, in your own work. Yes. Hmm. You know what, I, I used to think it was my responsibility as an artist, but I realize it's it's been the responsibility of Black folks for centuries, and we've always done this work. And it's to a point now where the, a shift in these systems to dismantle these systems, you know, we really have to we have to dismantle white supremacy. We have to name these these injustices that have um, affected us, that have violently impacted us. And so I, I do feel it is the responsibility of an artist to reflect the times. It is the responsibility of an artist to reimagine who we are, to expound upon our dreams, to build a new world. And so through my work, I'm really hoping I may not ha have answers for right now, but this is what I would like to see the world be. This is how I would like to see us exist. This is the archive I wish we had. But right now I think it's really coming to a place where we have got to strategize and really um, become serious and focused on what systems have continued to maintain their power that has been disruptive towards the lives of black folks, that has been violent towards the lives of black folks. And really looking at the leaders of right now, you know, I think it's so important when we look at the women who are behind the face of Black Lives Matter, everything they've built for us, everything they've done, those that have become become before us. So I don't see myself as a social justice activist. I see it happening through my work. And this is my way um, to this is how I'm doing my part. I may not be, you know, in the street marching, but through my stories, this is how I'm providing an, an alternate history, an alternate narrative for us to live in our fullness, for us to think about who, who we are in our fullness, what powers we possess, what ancestral memories do we have that remind us of our strength um, and what we're capable of. But feeling tremendously grateful for the leaders that we have now, for the leaders that have become before us, and hoping that this work helps continue to build a framework for how we um, continue to just challenge these systems that that have to be dismantled for us to to continue to live. Right. Well, the good thing is this dialogue that continues to happen, I think it's necessary. And so I'm glad that you decide to spotlight and highlight her life because I think our community needs to know who our people were, even though they're not here. But we also need to start the dialogue about healing the relationships in our community. Yes, yes, yes. There's so much healing uh, that still has to happen. And I think that even goes to your point or earlier, Paulette, regarding the race relations of the LA in the 90s between Black, um, you know, Black people, 
Korean Americans, and there's still so much healing that needs to happen there. There's still so many conversations um, that need to exist, but you know, little by little we're getting there. And even just how I've watched Ty and Shanice heal throughout the process of this film has been um, has been everything that I can ask for and more. I, you know, I didn't know what this film would look like. I didn't know what this process would look like, but I understand now why it had to take so long, why this is something that the film, we began it in 2017 and, you know, 2020, it finally is released on Netflix. But that process of just myself, my creative producer, Janice Duncan, my producer, Fam Yu Georgie, the relationships we built with Ty and Shanice were so important to us because we understood that they needed to be held through this process, that this film was for them. It was for the family. It was for black girls and black women of yeah. making sure that this is healing for them, making sure that the memories they share with us do not cause more harm, but that they allow them to release whatever they've held on to, to share whatever they've been wanting to speak about. And so making sure this entire process has been holistic and, and healing for them. Sophia, tell us about the, the family, because you mentioned a couple names, and, and I know that they're part of the family, but maybe the broader uh, audience doesn't know who haven't, uh, you know, they better go watch the film now, but if they <laughs> haven't seen the film, uh, tell us about who you met from the family, what, yeah. what your relationship with them. Yes, yeah, so in 2017, I had the beautiful pleasure of meeting Denise Harlins, who was Latasha's aunt that tirelessly fought for justice. Um, Denise founded the Latasha Harlan's Justice Committee shortly after Latasha's death. And she founded that with David Bryant, who was Denise's um, ex-husband. And unfortunately we lost Denise on Christmas day in 2018, but you know, she is, she was a champion. She carried Latasha with her ever since 1991. Um, she never gave up getting justice. And so it's been beautiful to see you know, even at the mural reveal, Latasha's entire family was there. And for them to see, this is the work that Denise started as well. At the mural reveal, I had I, I was able to meet Latasha's sister, Christina, um, who is talked about in the film, Latasha's younger brother, Vester, who goes by the nickname Trail, um, Latasha's grandmother, who was the one that took the children in after Latasha's mom died, um, Medea, whose real name is Ruth. And it was just so beautiful to see the family come together, the family, how Latasha has continued to hold the family together, how the family has never let go of this memory, how the family continues to honor Latasha. Um, and so again, the film is from the perspective of Latasha's cousin, Shanice Harlins, who was 14 years old when Latasha was killed. And then Latasha's best friend, Ty, who was 15 years old. Um, but it's been beautiful to meet the family, to meet some of Latasha's cousins. They, you know, they, it's, it's, What's been so remarkable for me is when I was looking at Christina, you see so much of Latasha in her from these, the few photos that we have of Latasha of, wow, this is what Latasha would have looked like if she's still here. Um, I should say Dr. Christina, excuse me, she is a doctor, her sister, but the family is doing well. The family is still working to keep her memory alive, to continue doing projects where they can finally share their story just because in the past, they've had so many experiences where people have abuse the name and their power of wanting to tell a story about Latasha without the family's consent, um, have exploited the name and the family just wants to be included. The family wants to be a part of this journey of these stories. And so I even told Ty and Shanice that I, I wouldn't do the film when I first reached out to them. I told them I would not do the film if they didn't consent to this because I wanted to make sure they were agreeing to being on this journey with me and that they were willing to share these stories, to share these memories, understanding what that means to revisit that time period for them. Um, but just feeling so so honored that we have the support of the Harlan's family and that they have been so happy with the film and the mural and um, continuing to watch them. You know, I'm going to continue watch them. Remember Latasha and everything that they're working on to keep her memory alive. Awesome. There may be some people who want to ask you questions. Yes. Uh, so we could uh, allow that to happen at this time. 
Yeah, and actually, before we do that, I'd I'd love to have um, just a brief video of the of the mural oh, so that everyone can see that. So we'll show that to you all right now. I should mention the mural is by the brilliant artist Victoria Casanova um, and just how amazing Netflix was with supporting this vision and them wanting to see this manifested as well. Like we could not have done it without Netflix or, or Victoria. Awesome. That's awesome. So yeah, absolutely. So I'll, I'll help um, with the moderation for you guys. So the first question uh, comes from Jendi Samai. Thank you so much. Hi, I really yeah. appreciate this. Thank you. Well, my question is, um, can you speak to the adultification of Black women as well as how that's linked with the dehumanization of Black women? Because for me, I feel like both of those things happen simultaneously, both within the Black community as well as outside. So I know they're different, but yeah. I feel like they're so intertwined for Black yeah. women. Mm. Absolutely. I mean, Black girls from a young age are, are hypersexualized. You know, um, I will never forget when I learned about the, um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting this case. And Bobby, you may be able to help me. Uh, the Grim Reaper, the Grim Sleeper? Yes, the, the Grim, Grim Sleeper. Sleeper. Grim Sleeper. What's really odd about that case, um, and the, for those that may not be familiar in South Central, there was a serial killer that was um, targeting uh, sex workers. But from the very beginning, when they were reporting or, or police reports about victims, it would say no human was involved. And that, that's just crazy for me to think about. Here we have black women missing and being killed and the reports from the beginning were saying no human was involved and just how that is a factor and how you know, black women are just seen as a number. We're not seen as, as just our most brilliant existence. We're not respected, we're not protected. Um, and so in, in my reading of the adultification of black girls, it was looking at just how young, young black girls from an early age, when we're relating them to peers outside of African American, you know, their white counterparts or Asian Americans, you know, we are not seen as innocent. They are seen as more innocent than us. We are constantly seen as adults. They force us to grow up in their image. Uh, we are seen as intimidating. We are seen the way our bodies are um, hyper analyzed. Even when you think about someone with like Serena Williams, people are threatened by our body. People. And why that needs to exist for us to understand how important it is to protect black girls. We know here we are as women, here we are as black, and then even for more, here we are as trans, here we are as queer, and, and wanting to hold space for that. So you know what? I'm so I, I'm actually just, I don't even know what it takes to to finally get rid of this adultification because we as black women, we understand our humanity. We understand the nuances with our existence. It's, it's everyone else that doesn't see it. It's everyone else that's refusing to see it. So I'm really hoping that through art, we can continue to just highlight our innocence and even you know holding, holding space for the nuances of we can be young girls, but still have you know experiences or mistakes or, or things that happen to us that 
should not happen to young girls, but that doesn't take away our innocence. There are some stories that Ty and Shanice shared with me about Latasha that I just didn't want to incorporate within the film because I didn't want anyone to take that and, and, and twist it. I didn't want anyone to take that and use it to discredit Latasha's innocence, to discredit her being a young girl, to discredit who she was and how important her life was. Um, and now I feel like I've completely gone off tangent and I don't even know if I've answered your question. So please tell me if you're, if you want to get me back on track, I'm more than happy to. No, you have. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you. Such an important topic. I remember being at a previous UBAA event with um, Monique Morris who mm. wrote out and I think these conversations are so important and critical because the world will always try to erase us as Black yes. women. Yes, yes. And then just thinking about the erasure, um, a lot of works that in inspired this process were like Sadia Hartman, who, you know, how she interrogates the archive, um, her idea of critical fabulation, thinking mm -hmm. about Alice Walker and Zora Neale Hurston. And there's a beautiful essay by Alice Walker called Looking for Zora. Um, I feel like you and I could just have a conversation about all of this. But um, for those that may not know, Looking for Zora was an essay that Alice Walker wrote because Zora's, Zora Neale Hurston's existence was pretty much erased. You know, after her death, some of her work was burned. And today actually happens to be Zora Neale Hurston's birthday. But Alice Walker went on this journey to excavate Zora Neale Hurston. And it's because of Miss Walker that we have this, you know, resurgence of Zora Neale Hurston. And so thinking about the black woman now and before me that, that focused on how do I undo this erasure? How do I make sure um, I can rebirth this archive and no one can, can you know, disrupt that again. Absolutely. Thank you for thank that. You. Thank you for your questions. We have a, a comment from Akila Witherspoon and we'll spotlight you now, Akila, and have you unmute. Hi, Akila. Hi, um, good evening. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm glad to be here. I'm not a Bruin, but um, I'm glad to have been, you know, a supporter and come in and, um, I grew up in California. I now live on the East Coast in the DC area, but I grew up in Northern California and calculating, I guess I was about seven when this happened, but my mom was very, um, she taught us about like what was going on and we learned a lot about like social issues and stuff that was going on with black people. And so um, recently I was looking, um, like whenever I hear about things that are happening and like some type of like, either if it's like genocide or, riots and stuff like that, then I get all involved and I start researching. And so when this whole stuff with COVID was happening and we were talking about like when the riots were happening and when people were protesting, it's like, um, there's nothing new under the sun and things always can, you know, things are a continuation. And so I was looking up, um, I was, I got into talk researching about the Watts race riots. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that happened before the whole thing happened with Latasha. Yeah. And so it's like, um, you know, we have to keep telling these stories. So it's really important. And even though, you know, you're a part of um, a younger generation, my generation, we have to keep telling these stories because you see it keeps happening. And so me, myself, I don't even, I've stopped going into Asian owned um, stores, particularly like hair salon or hair um, beauty supply stores, um, Chinese food, um, nail supply, all that, because I've been disrespected and mistreated. And it's like, you're not even seen when you go in there and they will talk to you crazy or do crazy things. And it's, um, but it stems from, you know, the system of racism, yeah. but it's, um, I noticed that a lot of immigrants that come to this country because they don't understand the race relations, they don't understand the tensions that happen. They come here and there's this mindset. So they already have this like view of black people not being human. And so it's like, they they feel like they can come and disrespect us too, but we also continue to go patronize them. And so it's like, you look at what happened and like, I was listening to some of the um, stories that people were telling that had lived through it. And I was listening to this um, Korean man who was a child when it happened and his parents were store owners and they suffered um, loss from it. And so he talked about how there was never really a healing or a reckoning, a reckoning from what happened. So then you come into 1991, it's still that same, that same tension, that same 
racial like drama and it existed other ethnic communities that come here and they have that same feeling towards us. And so it's like, we are now, you know, we're the ones that have to tell the stories and we're the ones that have to share our narratives of our stories. And so it's now, you know, we have to sort you know, support people like you, Sophia, to tell these stories. So like, what, like, what do you need from the community to be able to tell these stories and other stories like it? Um, because, you know, our generation and the ones coming after us, we have to be the ones that keep highlighting this. So um, I guess- Sheila, that's such a beautiful question. I was enjoying listening to your story and experiences and, and research. That's a really thoughtful and beautiful question. I think just even moments like tonight, just, just being in conversation to me is, is the, it's all I've ever wanted. Um, I remember the first film festival, the first Black audience I really had to see the film with that Black Star Film Festival, which is in Philadelphia. And that was the most beautiful and healing experience. Um, and I just love the conversations that come from what happens when we, as Black folks, you know, gather together, you know, we grieve together, we laugh together, we, you know, we, we share our ideas and our dreams together. And so just holding space for artists, you know, holding space for how can you know we present someone's work? How can we help make sure other people are seeing the work? Um, yeah, I think for me, I'm always like, how can artists support the community? How can artists make sure that people like Akila? How can we support you? You know, so it's it's interesting to have that question asked back because I'm always thinking, how do we make sure the community feels seen, feels heard? Um, so I thank you for that and just. I think the biggest thing for me is just creating spaces where these kind of conversations can happen, where artists and the community can come together and and share the work and discuss it. Because I'm and by no means an expert in you know the field of social justice, and so I learn so much from others. Um, I consider myself an artist, you know, that has elements of social justice in the work within my spirit but there are others and, and so many other brilliant minds that I can learn from and just wanna be in conversation with. And so I think that dialogue is the most important. Absolutely. Thank Akia, you. Akila, thank you for that, Sophia. And Akila, thank you. You do not have to be a Bruin to be in this space. We love <laughs> you. Uh, the next question comes from Cicely and I'll have you, Cicely unmute and we'll spotlight you. Hi. Cicely, I read your comment and it meant so much. Wow. Yeah, so, I mean, it was, definitely directed to you. I have to tell you that I was getting my hair done and we were just flipping through Netflix and then we saw <laughs> this movie and I was like, love talk song for Latasha, you know, and we clicked on it and it was just, you know, I'm shaking even thinking about it because I was just so there and I have been carrying this, you know, for, I graduated high school in 91. Mm. So pretty much, that was my senior year of high school when that happened. And um, I've just been saying her name ever since, even before saying her name was a thing. It just, it's never left. So I just encourage two parents, you know, if you're parents now with your young people, check in with them because I was traumatized by that event. Mm -hmm. And I didn't realize how I was just carrying that trauma, you know, for decades <laughs> until I watched her film and it was just like a complete letdown, you know, of, wow stuff that was was in me um so thank you for that and thank then I you. told my friend you know who's doing my hair I said I'm changing my middle name legally to Latasha Harlins so when I get that PhD she is yes. going to be on my diploma oh my god that that's so beautiful the story I mean I wish I was getting a law degree. that's what she <laughs> wanted right mine is going to be an education but that's I hope amazing that there will be some effort maybe to establish a scholarship something yes. for Black students pursuing law. Yes, yes. I mean, her name beyond the mural. I'm glad to hear about the mural. I'm going to go drive out and see it. But um, yes. there's yeah. still so much more to do. But we, that it, this just means so much. I'm so grateful to know it was healing. And I think this is something I didn't even realize until I started meeting people and talking to them about the film as we were filming it. Just how so many people have kept this in, how it's been just this memory that's no one's really talked about or had a space to share or release it. Um, and I'm so sorry to hear that it's been something you've had to carry for so long, but I'm just really grateful that this provided that opportunity to just kind of breathe and see 
who she was beyond just that security footage. And congratulations on your PhD. <laughs> when do you get it? <laughs> That's the big question. I'm only in the second year of the program. So. Still, that's amazing. I'm so, so excited and proud of you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. And then we had one more question. Uh, this actually comes from Ebony. Hold on a second. So Ebony asks us, it they said, it takes a village. We are so grateful uh, for Netflix recognizing the magic of this film. How can media outlets support emerging talent such as yourself in the development stage when it's harder to share the vision of young Black artists versus after a project is in the can when it's easy to support? Wow, that's an important question because there were so many times throughout this process where I would literally just cry because I wouldn't, I didn't know how to finish it. There were times where I was like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish this or how I'm going to finish this. And, and, my, and, and my creative producer would just help carry me through that um, because it's very hard, especially when you're a black artist that's, you know, doing something a bit more experimental. Um, what does it look like to support and trust their vision? And, you know, just, just supporting their vision and not forcing them to, bend or shape shift um, because it, it may seem more accessible if they do a film or a piece of art a different way. Um, making sure that they have, you know, just even some of the basic funding needs. There were a lot of times throughout this process, there were things I learned that I did not know about the film festival circuit um, that was really intimidating. And what does it mean to have mentors throughout that process to help these young artists navigate this landscape? But I think the biggest thing is by validating the vision and the voice of young creatives and not telling them they have to shift their ideas to be more accessible. Um, and, you know, especially when they're working to decolonize the Western gaze and they're working to reclaim ancestral memory, ancestral mm -hmm. powers, providing them with this, the space to, to let their process be whatever it was. I'm so grateful that, you know, our executive producers and, um, everyone that was a part of the project was so supportive of the vision. No one ever questioned it. No one ever challenged it. They, they really allowed us to do what we needed and trusted us and just made sure to hold us along the way. Um, and also they didn't force us to work faster than we needed to. I, I come from a background of photojournalism and video journalism. So I was always taught to work on a very quick deadline to turn around projects very quickly. But what does it mean if a young black artist is like, I need a year, I need two years, I need three years um, to do this. And please trust me that this time is, is needed. And, you know, it, it before Netflix, I remember thinking this will never live anywhere. No one is ever going to help this film get seen. And there were some outlets that reached out to us to house the film, but um, it felt like they wanted to, sh to shift a lot of what the film was. And when Netflix came along, they supported everything. They never questioned us. They allowed us to just exist as black artists. And we were like, this is the demands we have for what it means to let this film live on Netflix. And we want to make sure that we're activating the community, that we're supporting the community, that we're talking to young black girls. And they have just been so supportive of that. So thinking about what does that support look like along the way. And I just, I feel so grateful that Netflix came along and recognized the film and wanted to help us realize this vision and can go further than just what we created with this piece, but that it can and be something that lives within the community, lives beyond just, a, you know, a film, but we're honoring Latasha every, every step of the way. Wonderful. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Bobby uh, for some remarks. You got it, Bobby. Absolutely. Um, on behalf of the UCLA Black Alumni Association, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, I want to also thank, obviously, uh, Netflix and Liv for your um, support of not only the film, um, but with for the use of the Black Alumni Association, all the projects. Of course, we want to thank uh, Ebony and Sabrina for your support and your your uh, great comments uh, initially. And we hope to be able to work with you 
uh, more in the future, something that we definitely want to do. I um, want to thank Paulette uh, and the, uh, the Compton M NAACP. Paulette, you know, the work that you do is fantastic. And obviously, uh, UBAA wants to be a partner with you in working with uh, the community in Compton. So if you need us for anything, just reach out and we'll be there. Uh, also want to thank uh, everyone um, for giving up your time on a Thursday to participate. Um, want to thank uh, Michelle Johnson and uh, uh, her production company who helped to put all this together. Couldn't do it without her. And also her vision for putting together uh, this year's uh, summit. Uh, it's so important with everything going on um, that UBA be able to weigh in uh, with respect to uh, these issues. And finally, we wanna thank uh, our leadership team, uh, everybody that works uh, hard every day on behalf of UBA. So our board, our officers, uh, Twee was on earlier, but I know a, a bunch of other officers and, and board members are on, so thank you. And uh, finally, let's thank uh, the artist, uh, Sophia, for this you know visionary work. Uh, I know you're, you're an Ivy League person, but uh, now we consider you to be part of the UCLA uh, Black alumni family. So we're gonna hold you close and uh, we're gonna be watching for the, the next big collaboration that you're gonna have, hopefully with Netflix. <laughs> and, uh, hint, hint. Uh, well, I'm, I'm so honored to be honorary UBA. Um, Bobby, Paulette, I just wanna thank you for your thoughtful questions, your thoughtful comments. Our thank pleasure. you for being in conversation with me. Michelle, thank you. Thank you. UCLA Black Anum Alumni Association, I'm so grateful. Um, Netflix, I absolutely love you and thank you. Ebony, thank you so much. And again, just want to acknowledge how important the work is at Bobby and Paulette that you both do and how I am so grateful to see what you have manifested, the work you do in the community. So thank you and thank, thank you. you everyone that decided to join us tonight. It means so much. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. This, this has been awesome. I'm going to say one more time. She's not on camera. Bonnie, we love you. Thank yes, you for Bonnie. being the glue that puts all of this stuff together for us. Everybody, please give Sophia some snaps. I don't know if you've done that in the course of the night, but we definitely need to give um, some applause to her. We encourage you guys. This is the first <laughs> night of a four night event of some very, very impactful programming. Uh, an amazing lineup of, of alumni, of uh, thought leaders from around the country. So please come back and join us. Um, make sure you check your registration. If you, if you register for one event, you are registered for everything. So let folks know and come in and let's begin to think about how we can make impact in 2021 in the ways that, that Sophia is impacting the world with her, with her creative work. You guys have a wonderful, wonderful night. And we will see you uh, tomorrow night at the next event, which is at 530. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye.